All right, welcome to our first video lecture. Um, this introductory lesson is really focused on just giving us a review, background on some of the basic terminology related to finance and sport. Um, we're also going to look at ways in which sport organizations are financed and how they spend money. So we're going to identify common revenues and expenses. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at some of the external factors that might impact the financial health of a sport organization. So those are our main objectives for this unit. Again, this introductory lesson is really focused on making sure that everyone has kind of the same foundational knowledge um, so that when we move on to the more technical concepts later in the semester, we all have that same base foundation of information. So uh, some of this might be review for some of you, others it might be completely new, and that's fine. Um, we're going to use this lesson to even the playing field, if you will. All right. Okay, first things first, and I like to say this at the beginning of courses for sport management um, graduate students because I think it's an important thing for you to take into account in all of your classes, not just sport finance. Um, but I want you to think about this change of perspective that is needed as you're moving from undergraduate student to graduate student slash practitioner, right? Many of you have grad assistantships, so you're transitioning now uh, from a consumer of sport to now a practitioner of sport. And, and that really does require a change of perspective, um, particularly when we think about the financial management of sport. You know, at this point in your life, you've probably only thought about sport and recreation from the perspective of a consumer, right? How much is it gonna cost me to join this fitness center I wanna join? What is the price for the tickets to get into this sporting event? So on and so forth. Um, so, you know, what you've looked at in terms of finance and sport previously is probably more focused on, you know, how does it impact me or how does it directly relate to me? Uh, but again, I want us to use this class as an opportunity to shift that perspective a little bit. Um, I want us to think about how finance might impact us from the perspective of a practitioner um, and how that might impact the decision making that occurs once we are in the role of a practitioner. So whether it's through your GA experience now, or maybe the next job that you have in the sport industry. Um, I want us to work on shifting that perspective so that as we look at each of these financial issues throughout the semester, we're not just looking at them from the outside or from the perspective of a consumer, but that we're actually looking at them uh, from the perspective of a practitioner. Okay, uh, I think it's important uh, before we get into some of these basic concepts this week is to acknowledge the elephant in the room, right? Um, the coronavirus is happening. It's still very much a real thing that's impacting uh, both us as citizens in this country, but also as practitioners in the sport industry. Um, and certainly you're all uh, feeling that firsthand through your GA experiences this semester. Um, it's undeniable that the coronavirus is having a major financial impact on the sport industry. Um, so what I wanted to mention in this first lesson is just that um, I'm not going to spend every class period only talking about COVID-19 and how it's impacting the sport, even though that's sort of the, the main topic in the news every day. Uh, you know, obviously the hope is that eventually and hopefully sooner rather than later, we have a vaccine, uh, we can get back to normal uh, or some semblance of normal. And while that's certainly going to take some time, I do want to acknowledge that the financial concepts you learn in this class will hopefully help you beyond what we're currently living through right now. So uh, I'm certainly going to acknowledge the coronavirus and, and sort of some of the day-to-day -day impacts of sport, and I'm going to infuse that in some of our lessons this semester. And as you can see on the syllabus, we have an entire week dedicated to it at the end of the semester. But I also want to acknowledge that there are some basic uh, financial concepts that I want to make sure that we cover from a content perspective. Um, so I don't want you to think that I'm ignoring <laughs> that this is happening. It's definitely real and it's definitely going to be impacting us for a while in this industry. But I also want us to be able to identify and learn about some of these other basic concepts. But you will see it infused um, lessons throughout the semester. Okay, so some basic concepts for us to be aware of right off the bat. 
Um, finance, certainly a term you've heard before, but let's kind of look at the textbook definition here, and hopefully this will give you an idea of what to expect this semester when we talk about finance and sport. Um, so you can see here that the definition of finance is the science or art of managing money within an organization. Okay, I want you to think of this term finance in the context of this class as really this general umbrella term that also includes the application of several other financial concepts. So from budgeting, economics, accounting, all of these concepts which we will cover throughout the semester are going to be included in this kind of bigger, broader uh, umbrella topic of finance. Um, but ultimately what we're talking about is the managing of money uh, in an organization and typically that involves two main concepts, right? One, as we have listed here, how the organization generates the funds that go into that organization. And then two, how those funds are then used or allocated once they're in the organization. Um, so again, kind of a broad uh, concept here as we, we identify finance. Um, but I think it's important for us to have this kind of broad landscape um, so that as we move forward and we start to identify specific concepts, whether it's revenues and expenses that we're going to look at here later today, or you know, later on the semester when we start talking about budgeting, um, we know that this is kind of our baseline or our starting point. Um, and I think it's also important to note that you know, ultimately at the end of the day, uh, organizations are trying to make sound financial decisions, right? Uh, and we'll talk about the various types of sport organizations and how that might differ for each one. Okay, so speaking of, uh, as we think about the sport industry, and financial implications, I think it's important that we start by acknowledging that there are certainly different sectors of the sport industry. Um, and the difference in sector is certainly going to impact the way those organizations look at finance. Um, so we think about sort of these three broad subsectors of the industry. We have the public sector, which is going to be you know, organizations that are connected to or controlled by the government in some way. So public parks and recreation departments, uh, local municipalities, public schools, universities, athletic departments. Um, so that's sort of the public sector. Uh, commercial sector is going to include private entities generally. Um, and those organizations are going to focus primarily on making and selling products uh, with probably the ultimate goal to induce some kind of profit. Um, and then finally, we have kind of the nonprofit sector there. Um, obviously, this is a non-business entity. Um, typically, the goal here is to further some kind of social cause. Um, you know, again, it's important for us to think about these subsectors as we look at these financial concepts, right? So a city parks and rec department is probably going to view uh, financial management in a very different way than, say, a nonprofit clinical facility does or a professional sports team does, right? So Again, I'm not going to focus on one in particular this semester. I'm going to try to use a variety of examples in my practice cases and in the lessons because I know, you know we probably have a wide variety of interests in terms of where folks see themselves working eventually. So I try to do my best to kind of infuse examples from all three sectors. Uh, again, I think the one thing that they probably all have in common is that they're trying to make smart financial decisions that lead to a healthy financial situation for their organization. And that's you know a common thread for all of these organizations despite what their kind of budget might be or their you know annual earnings might be. Okay. So obviously we defined finance in this con context of money coming in and money going out. So it's important that we acknowledge some key terminology here. Uh, first uh, is going to be revenue. Okay, so this is the money coming in, um, and it, for a sport uh, industry, it's important for us to kind of identify what the common sources of revenue are for sport and recreation organizations. So we have five here that I've identified for us to kind of do a deep dive into, um, and then your book uh, goes into another one as well. Um, so we'll talk about these, we'll kind of identify and define them, we'll give some examples, um, and then from there, we'll do some practice cases as well. So you can really get a good perspective on where the money is coming from in order to operate these sport organizations. Okay, so we'll start with compulsory here. So 
Um, we'll come back to that one. Compulsory <clears throat> revenue is basically revenue that is required by law or policy uh, or it's mandated. So compulsory uh, revenue or income, <coughs> excuse me, um, is probably going to be used primarily by public organizations, right? So sport organizations that fall in that public sector. Um, so these are organizations that rely heavily on public taxes in order to fund their operations. <clears throat> so some of the common forms of taxation used for compulsory uh, revenues are obviously number one is going to be property tax. You know, primarily when you're looking at something like public parks and recreation, they're going to be focused on property taxes as a huge form of revenue. Schools are the same way. Um, there are other forms of taxation that we see used here uh, by uh, public organizations, particularly when we're looking at compulsory. So uh, tax increment financing is one that we'll talk about in detail when we get to our unit on facility financing. Um, sales tax, another great example. Um, then excise taxes, these are additional taxes placed on specific goods and services, and those are going to be in addition to your standard sales tax. Uh, I thought we might look at an example case here, a practice case here, just to get an idea of what this compulsory revenue might look like in real time or in, in real life. So here's a practice case, um, and I'm going to kind of give you some time to do it on your own, and then we'll, we'll look at sort of the answer together on the next slide. So practice case here is the city of Bloomington has implemented a tourism tax of 15% on all hotel room stays in order to generate more revenue to fund its parks and recreation division. In 2019, the average cost of a room per night was $150, and the hotels in Bloomington saw a total of 12,000 nightly stays. So, if the same number of nightly stays can be predicted for 2020, how much does the city stand to generate on its tourism tax in 2020? So, I'll give you a few minutes to look at that and play a little bit with that. And then uh, on the other side here, we will look at the answer together. Okay, if you need more time, go ahead and just pause and then revisit the slides. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and move on to the actual answer here. So, again, our question is, if the same number of nightly stays can be predicted for 2020, how much does the city stand to generate on its tourism tax in 2020? All right, so there are a couple of different ways that we can do this. Um, first of all, we can look at the average cost of a hotel room in Bloomington, which we know from the case is $150. We can multiply that by the 15%, which is the added tourism tax that's been initiated. So if we do that on a per nightly basis, we can see that the city's going to generate $22.50. Okay, so that's per night. Um, we also know that um, last year, or the previous year, there were 12,000 nightly stays in the entire year. So all we have to do to get to the total revenue is multiply that $22.50 per nightly stay times 12,000. That gives us a total of $270,000, right? That's money that's gonna go directly to the city uh, through that tourism tax um, on an annual basis. So that's one way we can calculate that. Um, the other is we can first calculate how much revenue is generated in total from these room stays, so we can take 150 and multiply that times 12,000. We know that 1.8 million is going to be generated overall, but of course we know that just 15% of that is going to go towards the city as part of the tourism tax. So we just multiply that 1.8 million times 0.15 and gets us to the same answer, right? So we're still looking at 270,000 in tourism tax revenue from this new tax. So either way is fine. Um, either way you want to calculate that. Um, you know, I start with some of these kind of easier practice cases just to get us in the habit of properly using percentages when we're multiplying and just kind of properly showing work. Um, so this probably feels a little bit easy peasy, um, which it's kind of meant to be. I, I want us to be able to 
have a basic understanding of how I want you to calculate problems when you're given these these issues. So um, make sure that you're showing work like we've done in this practice case on future cases. Okay. Before we move on to the next category of revenue here, I want us to uh, do a little pop quiz. So if I were to ask you what you think the number one line of revenue is or was for Division I FBS schools uh, in previous years, what would you say it is? So think about that for a minute. What do you think is the number one revenue for Division I FBS schools? If you said cash contributions from alumni and others, you would be correct. Um, so you can see here that this is from um, 2016, 25% um, of public Division I FBS schools, or sorry, 25% of their revenue came from cash contributions and alumni. And you can see that's more than ticket sales, broadcast rights, conference uh, payments, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, I bring up this data point because our next um, category of revenue income is gratuitous income. So we talk about gratuitous income, what we're really talking about is giving. Okay, so any kind of giving or donation that is provided to an organization would be gratuitous income. Um, so for those of you working in college athletics, you're probably pretty familiar with this line of revenue. Um, and, you know, uh, as opposed to compulsory revenue, which was required by law, obviously gratuitous income is kind of given free of charge from people who want to give. Um, and this doesn't just occur in college athletics. It can also occur, um, you know, for recreation organizations as well. Um, but generally what we're looking at here is either planned giving. So someone plans to give X amount of money um, each year or maybe a university holds annual fundraising campaigns where they raise money for specific projects. Um, when a university raises money for a specific project, especially a facility, we tend to call that a capital campaign. Um, so for those of you who've been around or maybe even those of you that are new, you've probably seen Hancock Stadium. Uh, in the past five years, Hancock's gone through some major renovations and the bulk of that financing did come from gratuitous giving. So they had a you know, major capital campaign to raise money for that facility. All right, next source of revenue that we're looking at is called earned revenue. So as you can imagine, this is direct revenue or sources of cash coming into the organization. Um, and generally, you know, uh, this is money that's coming straight from the companies or organizations users, right? So a lot of different examples of earned income in sport and recreation. You know, as we saw on a couple slides ago, ticket sales is a common earned income or line of income for sport organizations. Although and we're seeing sort of the impact of not having that line of income from COVID. Um, but other common sources of earned income, user fees that you might have, membership fees, um, any kind of concession or uh, merchandise, food and beverage sales, those would all be examples of earned income for an organization. Um, and one kind of unique thing about earned income for sport organizations is that generally they tend to have quite a bit of control over earned income, right? Especially in terms of pricing uh, those different sorts of inventory. Um, so earned income, an important uh, source of revenue. All right. This next category or source of revenue is equity and investments. Um, and if we think back to kind of our three areas of the sectors for sport organizations, typically equity and investment is gonna be falling into that commercial sector, right? So private sport organizations are the types of organizations that tend to rely on equity or an investment financing. So, you know, obviously a good example of this is, you know, a uh, team owner investing uh, by purchasing the team or having a share in that team. Um, and then, of course, there's also uh, groups of people that also invest in, in teams as well. Um, so you can either have kind of the single owner private investor model that the Clippers have. Um, Steve Ballmer, definitely the happiest uh, owner probably on the planet in the history of sports. 
uh, and then multiple owner, this more private investment model that the Dodgers have and other uh, organizations have. The multiple owner model tends to be more common, uh, at least here in the US, but that's certainly a common form of financing for sport organizations, uh, especially at the professional level. All right. Um, one other uh, form of revenue that's particularly important across the different sectors is contractual revenue. Um, so this is fairly self-explanatory, I'm sure, but basically what we're looking at here are contracts that a sport organization has with outside organizations that then provide services and monetary resources. So these are contractual agreements that are set up ahead of time, and then the revenue that comes in from those generated contractual agreements is contractual revenue. Um, so much like compulsory income that we looked at first, this line of revenue tends to be guaranteed, right? So it's not required by law like compulsory income is, but it is uh, technically uh, held up by that contract. Um, the nice thing about contractual revenue is that, you know, organizations can plan accordingly, right? If you have contractual income, you know when to expect that money to be coming in, and that helps with overall financial planning. So some examples here of some contractual income that sport organizations might use. Probably the most common is going to be a sponsorship agreement. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about those later in the semester. And certainly you'll spend time talking more specifically about those in your marketing class in the spring. Um, the other sort of subcategory here of contractual income is uh, contractual income with outside agencies. So. Basically, you have a sport or recreation organization outsourcing certain services to another company other than their own internal operation. Um, the two companies agree on terms, uh, and then from there, they determine a contractual agreement. Um, so some great examples of this, um, certainly college athletic departments work with athletic apparel companies, right, to ensure that their teams have uh, athletic apparel and equipment. Um, concessions is another great example, and we're going to look at a, a practice case here on the next slide of what that might look like for a sport organization. Um, golf courses often will, you know, kind of outsource their pro shop operations to other companies. So generally what happens here with these outside agency contracts is um, there's a base monthly fee that the sport organization charges to provide the uh, external company access, and then there's some agreement on percentage of sales so that the sport organization is getting that monthly fee plus a percentage of sales. Um, and that will probably make a little bit more sense when we look at the practice case here on the next slide. Um, but one thing that I want you to be thinking about, and I think a question I'm going to bring up in our in Zoom session um, next week is kind of what might be the benefits to outsourcing services and then what might be the risks? So as we're thinking about these concepts and kind of applying them, I also want us to think more uh, from an abstract perspective of what might be the benefits of doing this versus the risks. So think about that a little bit um, throughout the next week, and, and then when we get back together in our Zoom session, we can discuss. All right, so here's another practice case for you. Um, so here we've got a minor league baseball team that's decided to outsource its concession services to Sodexo. Their contractual agreement states that Sodexo will pay them a monthly fee of $2,000 for the duration of the six-month season, so that's uh, $2,000 a month, in addition to 33% of gross sales. In 2019, Sodexo generated a total of $245,000 in gross sales from concession sales at the stadium. And then in 2018, prior to outsourcing its concession services, the team spent $20,000 a month on payroll staffing and then $8,000 a month on miscellaneous costs. Uh, finally, they generated 242000 in gross sales. So we got a lot of info there. Um, kind of set that aside, and let's look at the question. Uh, one, we want to know what is the contractual income owed to the team for 2019. So we want to see kind of after we consider the base monthly fee and the percentage of sales, uh, how much is the team going to get from Sodexo for outsourcing, outsourcing that service? And then Part two of the case is, did the team make a sound financial decision in outsourcing their concession services? So I'm going to pause here for a minute and give you a second to try uh, this practice case. And uh, again, feel free to pause uh, here if you want to 
do it yourself and then come back and we'll look at the answer and work through it together. Okay, so what is the contractual income owed to the team? So part one of the case. Uh, well, first of all, we have to figure out what that monthly fee is going to generate. So we know there's this base fee of $2,000 a month, it's a six month season. So that means that no matter what, no matter what Sodexo generates an in income, the team is going to get $12,000 for simply giving the Sodexo access uh, to the, their facility and the ability to sell. But we also have to consider that there's also a percentage of sales piece to this. Um, and we know that uh, in 2019, Sodexo generated 245,000 in gross sales. So before they accounted for any of their expenses, 245,000. And the agreement or the contractual agreement here is that 33% of that will go back to the team. Okay, so we do the math there, 245,000 times 0.33, 33%, we get $80,850. So if we add those two together, we can see that the total contractual income owed from 2019 is $92,850. So that's the amount of money that Sodexo will write a check and provide back to the team. Uh, as part of their contractual agreement to outsource those concession services. Obviously, they keep what's left over. All right, so that was part one. Part two is, um, did the team make a sound financial decision in outsourcing their concession services? Okay, so here we need a little bit more information, right? We have to look back at the data uh, from what the team was doing before they outsourced their services, okay? So we know from the case that Prior to outsourcing their services, the team was spending about $20,000 a month on payroll, right? So just paying workers to work in the concession stand um, each game, right? So that's several hours that they're um, paying folks to work the stand. So that was about $120,000 for the six-month period. We also know that they had about $8,000 in miscellaneous costs a month. Um, so that's another $48,000 they were spending in terms of costs. So we add those together, of course, that gives us a total of 168000 in expenses. Uh, we know from the case that in the prior year, the team generated 242000 in gross sales from the concession stand. So pretty similar to what Sodexo generated, so that seemed to be pretty stable. Um, but of course, if we account for their expenses, um, basically what it cost them to operate that concession stand when they were doing it internally, uh, we see that they actually only made $74,000 in actual revenue um, that year. So if we compare what they generated when they were operating it alone versus when they outsourced it to Sodexo, seems like it was a sound financial decision, right? Because they're making quite a bit more money at the end of the day from contracting and outsourcing that service versus doing it in-house. Um, and again, I, you know, I want, we'll do another practice case like this in class next week so you get a little bit more practice. But I also want you to consider kind of the risks versus benefits of doing this because it is more than kind of the financial numbers at the end of the day. There's also some other factors we want to consider. So think about that and that could be one of our points of discussion when we return. All right, I'm going to pause here and do uh, another video so that you get a little bit of a break. But when you go to the next video, we're going to talk uh, the other sort of piece of sport finance that we identified at the top, which is the money going out. So we've already talked about money coming in. Now we're going to talk about money going out.